Good afternoon and welcome to Thursday's session of CARA Conference 2022, the impact of community-led approaches. I'm Adam Riley, Prevention Manager at CARACOL. Uh, before we get into today's session, like every other day this week, I have a few uh, uh, housekeeping slides to go through. So first, uh, CARACOL, we are Greater Cincinnati's HIV service organization devoted to positively changing lives in the fight against HIV through prevention, housing, and care. For more information, visit caracol.org. And to participate in today's we uh, webinar, if you have any technical issues, um, wanna share information or introduce yourself, use the chat function for that. But if you have questions for our panelists or presenters, please use the Q&A function as illustrated right here. Uh, if you're joining us from a mobile device, you can access the chat function by clicking the three dots more button at the bottom right of your screen. And you can access Q&A by clicking on the white Q&A button at the top right of your screen. And thank you to our sponsors. Presenting partners are Maytech, Midwest AIDS Training and Education Center at the University of Cincinnati, and AETC, AIDS Education and Training Center, with sponsorship from Gilead. And we will be offering continuing education credits for today's session. To be eligible for those credits, you must attend for at least 60 minutes and have your evaluation completed and submitted by 5 p.m. today. The links to the evaluation will be placed in the chat uh, several times throughout today's session. And you can also find QR codes on your PDF program that was emailed out last Friday that will take you to each day's evaluation. If you're seeking CMEs, contact Mary Beth Donica at the email list listed here. That email is also in the program and will be put in the chat for you as well. Disclaimer, this program is supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as part of an award totaling $4,198,345 with 0% finance with non-governmental sources. The contents are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the official views of, nor an endorsement by HRSA, HHS, or the US government. And these are some AETC resources for ongoing education throughout the year around HIV and hepatitis C. The links to these curricula will be shared in the chat for you. And now on to disclosure information for CME purposes. Our planning committee members have no disclosures to make and our presenters today have no disclosures to make as well. And this slide is just more information about the disclaimer process, disclosures, and disclaimer statements. And with that, we're on to today's um, session, which is Modernizing Ohio's Felony Statutes Around HIV, presented by Kim Welter, uh, Director of Finance and Special Projects with Equality Ohio, Nama O'Neill, MSW LSW with the Centers in Cleveland, and then Jaseel Chapman, HIV STI Program Coordinator for the Ending the Epidemic Efforts at Hamilton County Public Health. And with that, I would like to welcome Nama, Kim, and Jaseel to CARA Conference, and we're really looking forward to your talk today. Perfect. And uh, my name is Kim Welter with Equality Ohio, and I get to start us off, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a what is OHMM and um, what are the laws themselves? And then I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues who can talk more in depth. So we are the Ohio Health Modernization Movement. Next slide, please. Um, our mission is basically to end the criminalization of HIV in Ohio. Uh, we often talk about modernizing the law, um, but it would be nice to end it also. Um, so our mission is basically to mobilize a broad coalition of individuals, communities disproportionately impacted by HIV to replace fear-based stigmatizing laws that criminalize HIV status with evidence-based non-discriminatory laws that protect public health. Uh, next slide. And just some of the folks that um, you know are part of OHMM, um, including our beloved Caracol. Uh, so uh, we can move on from there. Next slide. Uh, so we the today, what we are going to hopefully cover is so that you will all understand the six felony statutes in Ohio that impact people living with 
Um, we'll investigate why, from a science perspective, these laws no longer make any sense. And um, you will all participate in dialogue, which will actually be through the Q&A, uh, about the effects of stigmatization on ending the epidemic. Next slide, please. All right, so for those of you who are legal wonks, um, these are the actual codes in Ohio. Um, I understand that there's a number of people out there who are not Ohioans, and welcome to you. Um, every, law is, every state is a little bit different, and a little bit later, I'm going to talk about some things that are true across the country, and I have a map that'll give you some idea of what your state might look like. Um, but here in Ohio, we have six um, felony statutes. Uh, it looks like five, but we've listed prostitution and solicitation in the same line as they're both a third degree felony. So let me go through these real quick. We have felonious assault. If you are, if you know you are HIV positive and engage in sexual conduct, and we're going to come back to that concept without disclosing your status, it is a, it is a second degree felony, two to eight years. I happen to know somebody who was charged with five counts of felonious assault. Uh, and is therefore serving 40 years. So just as an example, um, and did not transmit HIV. Um, then we have the prostitution and solicitation so that uh, if you are arrested for either of those while living with HIV, it could be a third degree felony, which is nine to 36 months. Loitering to engage in solicitation while living with HIV is a fifth degree felony, up to six to 12 months. Harassment with a bodily substance, basically causing another person to come into contact with blood, semen, urine, feces, or other bodily substances is a third degree felony for people living with HIV, nine to 36 months. A lot of you may recognize that a number of those bodily substances do not transmit HIV, uh, but that does not matter. Um, and then there's the do donation selling or donating blood plasma or blood products is a fourth degree felony if you are a person living with HIV, which is um, could be six to 18 months. Most of these things are illegal for anyone. What we're focusing on is the upcharge because prostitution, solicitation, loitering, harassment with a bodily substance are all misdemeanors for the rest of the population and would remain so. We aren't trying to like, uh, make those things legal. We're simply trying to take away that upcharge to a felony um, if you are a person living with. Um, so next slide. And then there's this part of it because you could be completely innocent and were arrested and your charges get dropped, but this kind of thing could still happen to you the moment you're arrested. And for a lot of people, these kinds of headlines in their communities um, ruin their lives anyway, even if they are, um, you know, found innocent or if the case is dropped, this kind of thing already may have happened to them. So part of what we're trying to do is stop this from happening by requiring people not to release names. Uh, next slide. So what is it? And this, we're trying to put this in as very simple words as possible. So it is the prosecution and imprisonment of people living with HIV for things that are perfectly legal or only minor crimes, misdemeanors, for people who have not tested positive. So notice you can only be charged with these if you know your status. There is some evidence in uh, surveys that that is a, a disincentive to getting tested. So I can't be charged with one of these felonies if I don't know my status, therefore I don't want to know my status. And there is some evidence in surveys that indicates that it is a disincentive. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so for those of you not in Ohio, <laughs> um, there are a dozen, I have a map coming up too. Dozens of states and territories um, have these HIV specific criminal laws. Um, and which include sentence enhancements for sex workers or for other underlying sex crimes. Typically, they are targeting um, sexual contact, uh, which is defined differently in a lot of states. I will give you an example here in Ohio. I'm, I'm not going to list it out, but sexual contact, contact was, was defined in Ohio law for purposes of charging people with rape. And so it was very, very, very broadly defined. Um, and so as it's defined in Ohio law, um, it, 
includes a lot of activity that we know now does not transmit HIV. But it's the concept, the legal concept that is used in these laws. Um, and then it also uh, targets spitting and biting. And there are some states where people living with are prosecuted under general laws, like reckless, reckless engagement or attempted homicide. Um, next slide. There is the map I promised. <laughs> uh, this is from the Center for HIV Law Policy, which is one of our national partners in the work. Um, but you can see um, a little bit of uh, how to read this. Um, so Ohio, all right, is a state with HIV specific criminal laws. Um, and we have uh, one of the states that may require registration as a sex offender if you are, um, specifically if you are found guilty of the felonious assault charge. And we'll get to this in a little minute, what that means more. But uh, you may end up for the rest of your life having to register as a sex offender, which um, makes it very difficult like to get into a nursing home later in life, to be able to um, engage with your children, nieces, nephews, um, et cetera. So it, it, it's problematic um, to have to register as a sex offender. Um, and we do not believe that most people um, who are charged under these laws in Ohio should have to do that. Um, next slide, please. So in plain language, right? So prostitution, that's the actual act, right? So you're arrested for the actual act. Solicitation, you are uh, the solicitation, sorry, I was reading the, the chat that came up that Adam sent. Anyway, solicitation um, is when you attempt to trade something for sex. So essentially all you've done is talk to someone and you can't transmit HIV talking to somebody. Uh, loitering to engage in solicitation, um, you are taking up space in a public place and law enforcement believes you have the intent to solicit. Um, so we sometimes talk about, you know, standing too close to the curb and waving at the cars as they go by um, could get you arrested for uh, loitering. Then there is harassment with a bodily substance and it is illegal for anyone to spit or otherwise annoy a, a law enforcement officer with any fluids and it's a misdemeanor. If you happen to be a person living with uh, and you do so to anyone, um, it's potential that you could face felony charges. And then selling or donating contaminated blood, uh, if you're a person living with, is also felony. Um, we've been doing research uh, into how these laws are used in Ohio, and it actually turns out that selling or donating contaminated blood, at least since 2014, has never been used. Uh, the one that is used the most in Ohio is harassment with a bodily substance, uh, followed by um, felonious assault, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So um, next slide, please. So a felonious assault, and we're trying to do this in as plain language as possible. So if you are a person living with HIV, the law prohibit, prohibits you from doing the following three things. And most people only know the first one. Um, but it means having sex with someone without disclosing your HIV status beforehand. And actually what that means is you, you have to be able to prove you disclosed beforehand. Um, and that is relatively hard to do. You know, we've seen judges say, well, it doesn't count if it's in, if your status is in your grinder profile, it doesn't count, uh, if you texted, um, because you can't prove when the text happened or when, you know, anyway, so the, it's a very problematic. Um, we have seen uh, successful proof when you took your intimate partner with you to a doctor's appointment and the doctor wrote down in the record that your intimate partner was with you that day and that you discussed your HIV status in front of them. Um, so we know that works. Um, but there aren't a lot of other um, things that we've seen that actually work in a courtroom. Um, sometimes we have recommended people actually sign contracts ahead of time, um, but it's a little difficult. And the next one is that ha having sex with someone when you, the person living with, know or have reason to think 
that the other person can't understand the significance of your HIV status. And if the person you're disclosing to is under the influence, then probably the law would see them as being unable to understand the significance of your HIV status. So 2 a.m. at the bar, doesn't matter whether you disclosed or not. Um, so that's part of this. And then having sex with someone who is younger than 18 year old, years old, if they are not your spouse, and it doesn't matter whether you disclosed or not, that will sim that is simply a felony, felonious assault. Okay, next slide. So these laws, we believe them to be four things. The first is unjust. So under most of these laws, transmission is not required. Alleged exposure is all that is enough for prosecution. The risk of transmission really isn't generally considered. Um, so you can't, you really can't use saying that you used a condom or you have a low viral load due to treatment. Um, you, you were not engaged in activities that are known to transmit HIV. That is rarely ever considered by a court. Your intent to harm, legally we call this mens rea, right? Your intent to harm is also not part of these um, laws. So you could, you know, not intended to, and they will still be, you still can be prosecuted. And proof of disclosure is often your only defense, um, but as we've kind of indicated, that's a little bit hard to do. And it is severe and disproportionate punishment. It's felony level punishment, even when no physical harm occurred. There is, sometimes you'll hear prosecutors talk about harm in terms of the emotional harm of somebody feeling like they were um, exposed to HIV, um, but there's, there's actually no physical harm in a, in a lot of these cases. Um, next slide, please. So we also believe it to be unproductive. There's no evidence these laws or prosecution deter any risky behaviors. So there, since these laws have been passed, there has been, as far as we can tell, no impact on new cases, right? Um, so no laws that have no evidence that they reduce the rate of H new HIV diagnoses. I mentioned how it could be a dis disincentive to learn your status. Um, it also sometimes alienates patients from healthcare providers because there's the feeling that the healthcare provider could be called upon to um, uh, testify against you. Um, there, it sends a one-sided message regarding prevention responsibility. Um, when when there's uh, sex involved, there's usually two people involved. Um, so you know they're it's saying that the responsibility is all on the person who knows their status. Um, it disproportionately impacts marginalized populations, and our research shows this um, when we look at. Uh, the general population of particularly uh, black men in the state, and then look at the population of people who are arrested under these laws, it is disproportionately high amongst black men. And it promotes stigma, which pushes people to the margins and then weakens effective response to HIV. The more you criminalize people, particularly for prostitution, solicitation, and loitering, the more you push them underground where they become even um, less safe um, and it's and less likely to seek care. Um, so we call it unproductive. Next slide. Unsupported is the third. HIV criminal laws, they can conflict with well-recognized legal principles, particularly that intent, right, mens rea. Um, and we want, so we want to modernize those laws to incorporate principles of intent and proportional punishment. Um, we feel that there should be, um, you know, one, you intended to do harm, and two, that you did physical harm. Um, and if those two things didn't happen, either one of them, then you can't, you shouldn't be prosecuted. Um, it ignores uh, the need for, um, you know, any level of risk, right? So you uh, doesn't take into account the likelihood that you will transmit. Um, and it's, yeah, you know, you're being prosecuted as if you attempted to kill someone. And we know today that, you know, HIV is not a death sentence. We're gonna get to some of that language here in a minute. 
And the burden of proof in this case is not on the prosecutor. It's on the accused to prove they disclosed. And we actually do, you know, in the work that we've done, we've seen a lot of these where not all, but a significant number are happen after a relationship breaks up. Um, and so there can, you could say that there, a lot of these are revenge um, prosecutions. Anyway, next slide. And they are unscientific. And just here in a moment, uh, Jazeel's gonna go into this in more detail, but HIV criminals are out of touch with our modern science. Um, they target no, even no risk behaviors. Um, and the demonstrated language by legislators and courts where they call people living with HIV lethal weapons or an HIV diagnosis a death sentence. Um, these are things we may have thought to be true in the 1980s and 90s when and particularly in the 90s when many of these laws were originally written, but we know them to not be true today. The, al the reality, HIV is not easy to transmit. It's a manageable chronic condition. It's not a death sentence. And with modern treatment, a person diagnosed in their 20s can expect to live a near um, normal lifespan. All right, I think the next slide, um, Claire, is Jaziel moving in, so I will Step back, and it's all yours, Jazeel. Thank you so much, Kim. I think you had a question in the chat. Um, I saw something pop up. Uh, yes, so um, they do test blood and organs um, for your status. So you could find out then, but remember you can only be prosecuted if you knew ahead of time what your status was. Um, but yeah, they test them. So you're not like you're going to actually donate blood to somebody who would then receive it. They would stop that process once they tested it and find it to test positive. But yes, you could find out that way, but you couldn't be prosecuted because you, if you didn't know ahead of time. And anyway, those law, that law has just never been used in Ohio. Okay, now I'm gonna say goodbye, Jesse. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. Good afternoon um, or good morning to everyone um, on the call. Thank you so much for having me today on Carol Cole. Um, as Kim said, my name is Jocelyn Chapman. I am the Ending the HIV Epidemic Program Coordinator at Hamilton County Public Health here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and today I'm just going to talk about um, the science um, around the um, antiquated laws that we have uh, currently have in Ohio and that a lot of you may have in the states of which you live. Um, so just a little background about EHE. Um, the federal government has a plan in place to end the HIV epidemic by 2030. Um, and this is kind of twofold. By 2025, they would like to see a 75% decrease in new HIV HIV infection rates um, by 2025 um, and by 90% by 2030. And um, two of the ways that we're going to do that is by um, testing individuals and also um, prevention um, methods. So part of why we want to modernize these laws is because, as Kim was stating, they discourage individuals from getting tested. If so from yesterday, know, which please. Was, hello. I'm sorry. Um, so a uh, part of reasons why individuals do not get tested is that if they, as Kim stated, if they don't know their status, then they don't know that uh, they have nothing to disclose. So um, it's the stigma surrounding HIV that is still fueling this epidemic. And it's the laws that we have on the books that um, is um, discouraging individuals from getting tested. As we, um, a lot of us know that 15, uh, percent of persons living with HIV um, are unknown or are, do not know of their status, and they are responsible for 40 percent of new infections. So we want to encourage individuals to get tested and know their status um, so that we can eventually end this epidemic, which we have the tools in place to do so. So let's talk a little bit of how HIV is transmitting. So it's transmitted um, as listed here, blood, uh, semen, cum, or pre and pre-seminal uh, fluid, uh, pre-cum, rectal fluids, vaginal fluids, and breast milk. 
Um, so it is not transmitted by spit, which we'll see in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. Thank you. Um, so HIV is not transmitted by urine, saliva or spit, as I um, just stated, sweat, tears, toilet seats, or eating utensils. Uh, you will be surprised that, you no, know, even now in 2022, uh, the misinformation that still um, circulates throughout our communities of ways you can contract HIV. Um, individuals still believe that you can get it from a toilet seat, um, which is not the case. Um, it's been disproven um, many, many years ago. So uh, these are ways that HIV um, is not transmitted. Next slide, please. So the likelihood of transmission. Um, so vaginal and anal sex are the highest um, risk of transmission um, when it comes to uh, transmitting HIV. Oral, se oral sex has little to no risk. Um, mutual masturbation, no risk. Um, syringe sharing, uh, the sharing of needles uh, comes at, with the high risk. And breastfeeding uh, comes with a moderate risk. And I want to talk a little more about um, breastfeeding when it comes with, to HIV. So um, the standard is different depending on where you live. And um, countries that um, uh, are better off than a lot of our lower income countries, they suggest that you breastfeed um, or, or um, I'm sorry, that you um, feed with a formula. Um, countries or communities that have uh, little access or no access to clean water or are able to sterilize their bottles, they say that um, the need, the means to breastfeed is safer for the baby. So it kind of um, depends on where you live uh, when it comes to breastfeeding, um, when, um, if, or, if or not you should breastfeed or um, feed your baby with formula. Next slide, please. So terms, let's talk about a little bit about the terms that um, we'll hear um, and we talk about when trying to modernize um, these laws. Viral load suppression, that's when an individual has, with HIV has a measured quantitative HIV RNA level below 200 copies per milliliter of, milliliter of blood. Um, some say it's even... Um, uh, even lower than that. So, so when the test is taken um, and um, it is uh, your, the, met, the amount of HIV in the blood is not able to be detected, that's when someone um, is, is, is uh, deemed to have uh, successfully suppressed their viral load which in turn uh, means that they have an undetectable viral load. Um, and that really means that they have um, less than 20 copies per milliliter, um, but as high as 50 copies per milliliter. Um, and it's the same with the test. The test won't detect um, any HIV um, in the blood. So durably undetectable is when someone has maintained that undetectable load um, for at least six months. Um, so most individuals that adhere to their medication will achieve viral suppre suppression, um, which is the goal. Um, because when that happens, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, U equals U comes into play. Um, and that is undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, and we'll get into that later. Um, so untransmittable, defined and established, um, that, you know, it's, it, it's effectively no risk that individuals will pass on the virus sexually um, if they have an undetectable viral load. Um, and again, that's the goal for all to um, adhere um, to their uh, regimen to achieve viral suppression. Um, what is ART? Antiretroviral therapy. There are over 40 medications currently on the market that are used to effectively treat um, those that are living with HIV. And uh, some of those same medications are used to prevent um, uh, individuals who attract an HIV um, if they are HIV negative and at risk for contracting HIV. So several different or several discordant is when uh, there's a relationship of um, individuals where one is living with the virus and the other is not. Um, so you may have um, two men, two women, or two um, non-binary individuals when those individuals are living with the virus and another one um, is not. Next slide, please, Claire. Thank you. So as I said, uh, you, you equals you, undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, it was a campaign started by the CDC. Next slide, please. 
So um, it is a scientific finding that people who achieve and maintain viral suppression do not transmit HIV through sex. Um, and there was a campaign started by the CDC a few years ago, um, what to say either 2018 or 2019, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that the science um, proved that individuals, and they had the studies um, that prove uh, these theories that individuals that achieve viral suppression were unable to sexually pass on um, the virus to others. Um, and they had uh, multiple studies with thousands of cohorts in each of these studies um, where they found it was essentially zero where um, individuals con contracted HIV from their um, from a person living with the virus that was virally suppressed. Um, there were a few cases where individuals were resistant to certain drugs that they um, contract HIV, but I believe there was only three out of thousands of um, the uh, case studies that were studied. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, uh, like I was saying, some of the studies, HBTN 052, Partner, Partner 2, and Opposite to Track Studies follow thousands of male and heterosexual HIV serodifferent or serodiscordant couples. Um, there, were, there were no genetically linked HIV transmissions when the partner with HIV was taken art and was virally suppressed. So um, in other words, that the individual that um, was HIV negative that contracted HIV did not um, get it from their partner that was on the study with them. Um, the gene uh, there was no genetic link to the um, partner that they were in the study with. Um, so these studies provide robust evidence that individuals do not sexually transmit HIV if they are virally suppressed or have an undetectable viral load. Um, so that is so important when we are talking about modernizing these laws that we have in place. Um, individually, we, we um, as Kim stated earlier, um, and as many of us know, HIV is no longer a death sentence. So in order for us to end this epidemic, we have to get those, uh, we have to encourage individuals to get tested um, and those living with the virus to um, stay in treatment, get on treatment and stay in treatment so they can achieve viral suppression uh, where they won't pass the virus on anyone else without the fear that if they are um, in a consenting sexual relationship that they will be uh, incarcerated um, for having HIV. Um, HIV should not be criminalized. Um, so um, these are some of the things that we uh, need to do um, as far as encouraging individuals to be tested, to find out, to be aware of their status. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we need to inform all patients about U equals U. Care providers should inform all patients that people who keep their vi HIV viral load at an undetectable level by consistently taking HIV uh, medications, uh, they won't pass a, uh, the virus on to others through sex. Um, sharing this message definitely helps. Um, you know, as I stated, the CDC started this campaign and um, anything we can do to amplify the message um, will help um, erode the stigma that is still out in the community when it comes to HIV. Um, diminish stigma associated with HIV, reduce barriers to HIV testing and treatment. Um, there are still uh, so many barriers when it comes to uh, individuals accessing the um, health care they need. If we can diminish and reduce any of those barriers, um, as, many, as many barriers as possible, that will help um, individuals be, uh, be aware of their um, status. Increase interest in starting and staying on antiretroviral therapy. Improve self-esteem by removing the fear of being contagious. And support uh, healthy sexuality regard regardless, regardless of your HIV status. And reduce sex partners' concerns. So all of this basically just boils down to education. Um, educating um, individuals is key. Um, to uh, one, knowing uh, their risk factors, knowing their status, um, and knowing what can be done to protect themselves if they are not living with HIV, and um, uh, individual that is living with HIV, what they can do to protect um, their partners um, as well. Next slide, please.
So some of the best practices, adherence. Um, so uh, we hear a lot about um, how individuals, um, how important it is for individuals to stay uh, connected in care. Um, that, that is so important because uh, if we are to end this epidemic, we need those living with HIV to remain in care and remain adherent to their medications so that they may achieve viral suppression. Um, having viral load monitoring, um, following the guidelines for um, undetectable, which is uh, below uh, 200 milliliters per copy, um, and screening and uh, treatment for other STIs other than um, HIV. I know here in Ohio, we are having um, a syphilis outbreak. So, um, and syphilis, syphilis is what we uh, uh, like to call the close cousin to HIV. So, um, testing of uh, individuals for other STIs as well, uh, because um, as we know, when individuals contract other STIs, they are more likely um, to contract HIV. So it's important to um, test individuals for other STIs as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so you equals you in the effort to end the epidemic. Um, as I stated, the um, we want to end the epidemic by 2030. Um, so what this looks like, 95% know their HIV status. 95% of those living with the virus are in treatment. 95% of those in treatment have achieved viral suppression. And the amazing news is that this is an achievable and an, an attainable goal. Um, we have all the means in uh, place to achieve these goals by 2030. Um, so uh, in eight years, we can... Um, say that we have uh, basically eradicated um, HIV from the United States. So the uh, educational campaign ends to uh, aims, I'm sorry, aims to improve um, persons living with HIV's quality of life um, and encourage uptake and adherence to treatment and reduce HIV related stigma. Um, it's the stigma that, um, like I said before, that is still fueling the epidemic and the, and the stigma that is still um, keeping these antiquated laws on the book um, that need to, the laws need to catch up with, um, as Kim stated earlier, need to catch up to where science um, currently is. Um, and the U equals U campaign, key message again, persons living with HIV on treatment, achieve and maintain viral suppression, cannot transmit HIV to sexual partners. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. So this is for um, those of us living in Ohio. Um, and some of these may uh, pertain to uh, some of you that are not living in Ohio, some of the laws that you may have on your books. Um, so why they are a a um, antiquated. And this is something that Kim um, also went over. Just a quick recap. There is effectively no risk of transmis transmitting HIV when someone has an undetectable viral load. Um, and the CDC says many state HIV laws are outdated and criminalize behaviors that cannot transmit HIV. And Kim so elo eloquently um, uh, stated this earlier of um, why these uh, laws should not be um, still enforced um, in the states that still have these laws on the book. Um, as they, um, as you see, discourage HIV testing, as I talked about, um, increase stigma and exacerbate disparities. Um, people at risk of being exposed to HIV also can use pre-exposure prophylaxis medication called PrEP, um, which I liken to birth control for HIV. Um, it's been proven to be 99% effective in preventing people from getting HIV from sex. Um, there are three uh, currently FDA uh, approved medications on uh, uh, um, uh, approved for the usage of PrEP. Two are in pill form and one um, is an injectable that is given every eight weeks. Um, so these have been proven, um, as you see here, to be 99% effective in preventing a new um, uh, new infection. Um, and and uh, sidebar, there's um, a study going on right now uh, for PrEP that is studying a new drug, lenacapavir, um, for the use of PrEP that uh, would um, uh, administer 
uh, two shots a year, so every six months. So science is definitely progressing to um, uh, where we are making it a lot easier for individuals to adhere to um, different regimens that will that fit um, their circumstances. So it's, it's great that we have so many amazing um, advances on the horizon when it comes to prevention and also treatment. Um, and HIV related stigma discourages testing and prevention prevention practices and creates confusion about the roots and relative risks of HIV transmission. Next slide, please. And these are uh, some of the resources, some of the sources I use in this information, CDC, HIV.gov, HIVLawAndPolicy.org, and HIVJustice.net. And I, um, that's all for me. Thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to pass it over hey, to my Jaseel, colleague, Naima. Jaseel, yes. before, you, uh, before you fully leave, I've uh -huh. got a question in the chat that I'd like to pose to you since you were talking about U equals U. Uh -huh. um, so we got a question that says, does U equal U, does U equal U apply to needle sharing? I feel like I always hear it specifically mentioned for sexual transmission only. That's a great question, um, a, a question that we are still asking ourselves. Um, so the studies that have currently been done have only been focused on uh, through sexual contact and not through um, needle sharing. So um, I, 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 I personally have not seen the science that says otherwise. So I'm gonna say until the science states that um, it is through needle sharing, um, one would one would think that it would still apply, but um, the studies and the science have not shown that yet. So it's only been for sexual practices. So ba basically, all of the research around U equals U is focused on sexual transmission. So we just don't have the evidence to to say for other potential modes of transmission. That is correct. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I see there's, there's another question in there. Um, that's a great question, John. I am not sure. Um, I can find out though. Um, but that's a great question. Um, so the question is, as we in Ohio have a gubernatorial election in November, is there any knowledge of Democratic candidate Nan Whaley's position on Ohio laws regarding HIV? Um, if, if anyone on this call knows um, the answer to that, please feel free to chime in. Um, I myself do not know her position, um, but that is a great question. I would say, I don't know that that specific question has been posed to her, but I will go look and see if we have any records of it. I'm gonna uh, link to Equality Ohio's scorecard of legislators. If there is anything there, if on that position it is there, but I am not aware of her being outright asked or Mike DeWine for that matter either. Thank you, Cal. Um, and let's see, is there a Hamilton County uh, U equals U committee? Nate, there is not, um, but that's a great question. Um, and that could be, um, uh, we are uh, starting two campaigns here at Hamilton County uh, Public Health, the prep campaign, the testing campaign, where U equals U will be a focus, um, but there is not um, a specific committee um, that is uh, uh, just geared towards U equals U. All right, I think that was the last question. So I'm gonna turn it over. Thank you all so much. Uh, I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, Naima. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Naima O'Neill. I am a social worker here uh, it says uh, Circle Health Services, but we have merged with Centers for Families and Children. Um, so we're now called the Centers, and I am located in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I'm a medical social worker. I've been a social worker for about 13 years now, um, <clears throat> working with individuals that are living with HIV. Um, there's a lot of things that I could talk about, but I don't want to prolong. Um, I don't want to I want to go to the slide. So um, I am also uh, a person who is living with HIV, and I've been living with HIV for about 30 years now. So 40 years into 
the virus and and just imagine that 40 years hiv has been around um we've done a lot we have um people who are now living longer and allows people like myself to grow into old age, if you want to call it, or become seniors. Um, and so we, we know how to treat people. We know how to keep people um, healthy, individuals for the most part. We know that if you take your medication, you can live well up into your 70s and 80s. So we know all of that. Um, we also know that in order to end the epidemic, we need to get everyone tested. So we need to know everyone who's HIV positive and we need to know everyone who's negative so that we can keep them negative um, by using PrEP that was um, talked about earlier in the slides um, and use um, condoms is also a relative and with a person who's positive, if they have a relationship with someone who's negative, then that person by them taking their medication is actually helping the person who's negative stay negative because they're not sharing their virus with them. So because we know all of this, then what is the issue? Um, and what do, what have we learned and what how far do we need to go? Next slide. So this picture is to talk about the elephant in the room. It's a huge um, stigma, it's a huge myth, it's a who it's a huge barrier for people in our community to get tested. It's a huge barrier for people. Um, who are living with HIV. Public interest, next slide. So um, HIV stigma, we need to consider it as an epidemic. We keep it separate, but it actually is a reason that we can't end HIV in, the, in my lifetime. Um, and it also fuels a lot of things with people living with so that they don't wanna take their medication. So we have self stigma, but the stigma that I'm gonna talk about is community stigma um, because they're fueling um, why people don't wanna get tested because the laws in not just Ohio, but other states are a deterrent. And so we think that if we tell people um, you know, you could be prosecuted, that that's gonna keep people from having sex. No, it's not. What it is gonna keep people from is getting tested because as Kim stated earlier, if I have no knowledge of my HIV, I have a suspicion though, because of things that I'm doing in my life. So there's always a suspicion that I may be positive depending on what I'm doing, um, but because I'm not tested, I can't be prosecuted. So a lot of people refuse to get tested or don't want to get tested because they know that once they are, there is known and not only known by them, but it's known by the state that they live in because that's the way um, when you test positive, you end up in, in a state registry. So they know that. And so um, in order to not be prosecuted, just not get tested. And so this is considered to me to be an epidemic that we need to work on. Next slide. So let's look at this. Um, this is what stigma looks like. So you see the birds um, is the community on one side, but the person living with is all by themselves. So stigma is fueling people not being inclusive of everyone in the community. They're kind of isolated. Um, and we know that with um, COVID, it, it isolated people living with HIV further because they didn't have a support system. So you, again, you have self stigma, but the stigma that we're looking at right now is community. 
um, because they're not including, not supporting, and they're making people, because of these laws, feel that they're on the, the vine or the, the cord by themselves. Next slide. <clears throat> so we know, yeah, those myths are there. They were talked about. Um, they still exist 40 years later. I have heard a lot of people who still have issues with their family members not allowing them to do certain things. If they use the bathroom, they go right behind them and they bleach it. If they um, have uh, cookouts, they will give them paper stuff that's disposable and not let them eat off of um their regular china or you know anything that's glass they give them paper products because they don't understand that that's not how the virus is spread um some people will not allow a person who's hiv positive to kiss them or their children because they still feel that that's the way the virus can be spread so all of these are myths but they still exist 40 years later next slide so um, what if it, what if it were, and we still have stuff about soda cans, we still have stuff about drinking from persons who are HIV positive, people still believe that uh, there's a myth. So again, these are all ways that the virus is still um, in control in terms of how we feel um, about people and how the virus is transmitted. Next slide. So again, this was a slide that was shown earlier, but um, I tell you even today, um, people are being charged with this virus. Um, and the, the bad thing about it is that a person who has a, a partner who wants to keep them in a bad relationship um, will use it and they will use it against them. And we as a community, don't step up to the plate, we call that person who's living with the virus a predator. And it's been known. Um, and in our state, if you are sent or are, are found guilty, you could be labeled as a sex offender, which means that I, if it were me, I couldn't see my grandchildren. Um, my kids are too big, so I don't really care about them. But um, my grandchildren, I wouldn't be able to see. I wouldn't be able to live near a school. There are a lot of things that I wouldn't be able to do. And if I had a partner who decided to do that, before the dust settles, I could lose my job. Um, I could be incarcerated all for a lie because I'm deemed guilty and I have to prove myself innocent. And anyone who's positive, um, would have that happen. So let's think about that for a minute as we look at the next few slides that I have. Next slide. So um, biases work against HIV um, because it allows ideas that are not, um, they're prejudicial, they're closed-minded. Um, they don't allow people to freely be who they are. They're unfair. And they're usually unfair on certain, with certain populations. Um, and they're unfair. And when I call populations, I'm talking about people living with um, HIV. Next slide. So we all remember OJ symptoms. And this is a, a good example of a bias. Now, even though he was found not guilty and he was acquitted, many people still remain biased against him years later and they treat him um, like he was a convicted killer anyway and that's a, an example a great example of how biases can ruin a person's life so whether you believe it or not and i'm not going to say one way or the other think about it and then when you think about it think about it as it relates to HIV and AIDS. Next slide. So biases and stigma in HIV include language, um, it's, uh, and it's around intersexuality. Um, and then later on, I have a slide that talks about public health approaches. Um, should it be more holistic? Because currently, 
is um, we live in silos and that's the approach that we do in our public health departments. Next slide. Um, so HIV, is, HIV stigma is a social justice issue and everyone on this call and everyone in, our, in your communities, wherever you live, this is something that we need to work on and everyone plays a part in it. Um, and it takes everyone at the table to eliminate HIV stigma. Because to, to tell you the truth, if we don't get rid of the stigma, we are never gonna end HIV in our lifetime um, because of people's mindsets need to be changed, but it comes from the top down. So changing the mindsets of people who make the laws that affect people living with HIV, we need to do it. We don't need the laws to go away because uh, honestly, as a person living with, I do know that some people may uh, do some things that aren't necessarily above board, but again, we have to look at them. Um, we have to look at their mental health state. We have to look at um, the fact that maybe they are not um, they have some self stigma and they load themselves. And so some people lash out. And so we still think, I still feel that HIV is something that we need to um, talk about with everyone. And we need to get rid of stigma if we wanna um, get rid of HIV in our lifetime. Uh, next slide. So <clears throat> we, um, know how to talk about HIV to abort stigma. But I think that a lot of it has to do with some of the language that we use. Um, I have a slide that talks about that. Um, but we, the, what we say and how we say it, we need to keep that in mind because words matter. And we should know that from anything else in our life, that when negative words are put forth, that creates the stigma, that creates the bias, that goes against the community's effort to end HIV around the world. And it's not just here in Ohio, it's everywhere. So our language, we need to stop and we need to change. And we need to make sure that we're working against language um, in term, I sh I'm sorry, we are working against negative language so that we can promote healing. Um, negative language hurts people. And we have a lot of hurt people, not just with HIV, but a lot of things that we do. And, you know, we call people prostitutes when a lot of them are having sex because they need to survive. Um, so that's where the intersectionality, uh, intersectionality comes in, and we need to work on that. Next slide. So these are some things that we need to avoid, and this goes with the language. So I'm not going to read all of them, but as you can see, and there's other things that could be used. Um, so to catch AIDS, um, you know, so AIDS and HIV are not the same. And I, I honestly think that we did a disservice by using AIDS, but you are, you acquire HIV, you don't require, acquire AIDS. Um, and even if you use AIDS, for a lot of people living with, they don't want to get that diagnosis um, because they are, um, they are, uh, they don't wanna take their medication. They don't wanna do what they need to do. Next slide. So this is a, a excellent quote um, because we have to look at everything with people. Um, as Audre Lorde says, no, there's no single issue struggles. Um, and so since there aren't, and we don't live single issue lives, our struggles are multi-layered. Next slide. Um, so intersectionality, as you can see, is race, gender, sexual orientation, poverty. It puts, it marginalizes people, and it just really works against um, HIV um, because we know that it, it impacts vulnerable populations, and those are the ones that are mostly at risk. Next slide. Again, this, this slide talks about the same thing. 
Um, but we need to address everything. We need to address racism. We need to address um, poverty. We need to address mass incarceration, homophobia. There's so many layers to this that affect HIV um, and affects HIV and stigma that we really need to look at all of it um, and if we want to end the epidemic. Next slide. So um, this slide talks about what should we do? Holistic approach versus silo approach. Um, we should be treating a whole community versus a group of people within a community. Community health versus individual health. Um, I know that I went to um, Montreal. They have health care for everyone. Is it a perfect system? Probably not. But I think that the way that we're doing it in this country works against trying to um, end HIV in our lifetimes. And we want to prevent every prevention for everyone, not only for certain individuals that society deems at being at risk. Next slide. So that is actually all of the slides that I have. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, I'll be happy to help with that. But that ends my portion of the presentation. Thank you, Nema uh, and Kim and Jaseel. We do have a couple of questions uh, that I wanted to just bring to your attention. Uh, one of them is, uh, it says on county jail websites for inmate directory and also on local newspapers, I have seen an inmate's name, what they were charged with, solicitation, et cetera, as well as their positive HIV status. How are jails and newspapers allowed to openly disclose to the public an inmate's HIV status? Does HIPAA not apply? Does, does HIPAA not protect this? Yeah, HIPAA does not apply. Um, HIPAA applies to just certain folks, and those are folks who are generally in the healthcare industry. Um, you'd have to read the actual like law, right, uh, to know exactly, but law enforcement and journalists uh, do not have to. That's why one of the things that when, if we modernize the criminal codes, one of the things we wanna do is make it so that names cannot be released in these cases. Um, that would help prevent um, exactly what uh, the person asking that question uh, is seeing. Hi, Nate. Thanks, Kim. And then there was another question in here that it looks like Nama, you typed an answer to it, but could we uh, just verbally explain it to the audience? So there's, uh, due to the formula shortage, many women are sharing breast milk here through online local groups. Is there anything I should tell these women openly discussing this with me? Okay, so I put in the chat and, and because I, I um, stay on top of certain things, there are a group of women um, and there's a website that I can share and I'm, I apologize, I don't know the website offhand, but they are posing this question and there are a lot of women who are now having children because of U equals U and because of the fact that um, the medicine is so great. And so, and again, some of these women are breastfeeding their children and they're having negative babies. So I don't wanna go, um, and, and it is a moderate risk, but it, I believe that it's a little lower than moderate, but again, I'm not a, a doctor. So I don't want to get into the expert of that, but I can, if anyone, I put my email in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to email me, I can email you the website. It has a wealth of knowledge. They've done webinars um, on mothers breastfeeding their babies. Um, there are, are, are a group of women on this website that have a support group. They also, um, to openly talk about their struggles um, because you really have to have the right healthcare provider for yourself and also the right baby um, doctor, and I'm, I'm using simple language, that work together. So they have to agree that it's okay because there are some doctors that will discourage a woman from breastfeeding if she's living with but there's a group of people who are working and showing evidence 
that breastfeeding your baby if you're positive um, does not put that baby at risk. Um, and I will be happy to share the website with anyone who wants it. Thanks, Nema. Uh, well, right now it doesn't look like we have any other questions currently, but people do have email addresses and ways to contact people. Uh, so if you do have anything that you didn't get answered during today's session, feel free to reach out to one of our panelists, um, or you can reach out to me and I will connect you with them. Uh, so just a quick reminder before we stop today's session, uh, you've got your evaluation. If you're wanting CMEs or continuing education credits, fill that evaluation out by 5 p.m. today. Um, and we hope that you can join us tomorrow uh, where we'll have Maria Bruno from Equality Ohio talking about the state of LGBTQ rights, not only in Ohio, in Ohio but around the country um, at city halls and federal courts, kind of covering a lot of ground. And we'll also have Mayor Aftab Pierval uh, in making introductions and being part of our conference tomorrow as well. So again, thank you everybody for joining and we hope to see you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day.